Welcome back to Sahara TV. My name is Rodolfo Okonkwo. We are continuing our coverage of the inauguration of President Mohamedou Buhari. Now we want to go and give you a historical context of what happened today. We have had a lot of people say that today is historic in many aspects. One is that uh, this is the first time that an opposition party, the presidential candidate of the opposition party, is uh, taking over office from uh, the ruling party in the history of Nigeria. So we are now going to go to the University of Vanderbilt uh, in Tennessee, United States, to talk to Professor Moses Ochono. Professor Ochono, welcome to Sahara TV. Okay, I think we lost him for a moment. Uh, we are going to try to reconnect with him and talk to him about the historical importance of this. People say that, what does it mean? How does that um, relate? How do you put it in the historical uh, nature of Nigeria? What is historic about this? What does that say? Is there a, a real change? Have we turned the corner, so to say? Are we moving in a different direction, or is this just going to be a blip? Is this something that we can say is sustainable? So we're going to talk to the professor of African history at Vanderbilt University as soon as we get him back. So stay tuned. In the meantime, uh, I want to inform you that we are going to give you the chance to weigh in. We would like to hear your view if you were there. And uh, in Abuja, we want you to join us and tell us what you think. I think we got uh, Professor Moses Ochono again. Uh, Professor Ochono, welcome back to Sahara TV. Thank you, Rudolph. All right, so everybody we've talked to today, they've all said the same thing. This is historic. It's historic what happened in Nigeria. Why is it historic? For a number of reasons. Uh, first, uh, it's the first time, as everyone knows, that an incumbent uh, is, uh, lost an election, considered. Um, there's, there's a smooth, peaceful transition of power from an incumbent government to a victorious opposition. Uh, it's historic for another reason, which is that you have someone who had uh, ruled the country before, who everyone agrees, uh, under different circumstances, and everyone agrees, made some mistakes. He has a historic opportunity. It doesn't happen very often, but he has an opportunity to correct those mistakes, to learn from the past, and do some, something new. Uh, the third reason why I think this, uh, is, this transition uh, is historic is the damage, the extent of the damage done to Nigeria in the last 16, 16 years, maybe 20 years. Uh, Nigeria was brought to her knees. And so I think Buhari was propelled to his current position by mass anger, by mass frustration, by mass outrage. It's never happened before in the history of Nigeria. Uh, of course, the flip side of that is that there's a lot of expectations that, has, that have now been placed on his shoulder. How he navigates those expectations, how he goes about fulfilling those expectations will be the test of his uh, presidency, I think. Mm. Okay. Now, the last time he was head of state, uh, we remember him for saying that we have no other country other than Nigeria. We must stay here and salvage it together. Uh, I think 20 years from now, what's more, what most people will remember him for saying today will be, I belong to everybody and I belong to nobody. Now, what does that mean? It's a powerful statement. Uh, probably the highlight for me the most important highlight of the speech, quite frankly, the speech that he gave at, the, at his inauguration, I think he sends a very powerful signal to the political elite. One of the things that, you know, was the hallmarks of the last two administrations, Jonathan's and Jared was, you could even extend it to the Obasanjo administration, was that they were more concerned with appeasing political elites, certain political elites. They were beholden to these political elites. They practically hedged their bets, their political bets, uh, mortgaged their political careers uh, on this, uh, on the approval and the support of these political elites to the detriment of the Nigerian masses. They were more concerned with appeasing these elites than doing the right thing for Nigerians. Uh, and, and so saying that, Buhari saying that he belongs to all Nigerians, he belongs to no one, I think it's a seminal statement that indicates uh, the direction of his presidency, that it's not going to be a tool of certain political elites that if people had illusions, especially the politicians who supported him, 
who were part of the APC coalition that propelled him to power, if they were under any illusions that they could control him and dictate agendas to him. I think this was the clearest statement from, from him to, to let them know that he, was, he would be more concerned with solving the problems that confront Nigerians rather than appeasing them, rather than doing their wish. I think it marks uh, a political coming of age. Uh, if you, it's very ironic, it's uh, 72 years, uh, you know, but uh, it marks a political coming of age. Mm. Uh, for him, he's his own man. Mm. He's saying to them, you can't control me. I'm brought into power by mass outrage, by mass, a wave of mass expectation and outrage. Mm. Uh, and I'll, I'll be foolish to allow myself to be controlled by you. I think we've never had a, 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 as clear an articulation of political independence as uh, in, our, in our political history as what we just heard from Buhari. So I think it's very significant. Mm. Now, you, you talked about expectations, and we've had a lot about the expectation being high. People are expecting a lot. Uh, now, don't you think that also in the past that we complained about Nigerians having low expectations? How could this be a bad thing? Well, uh, it works both ways. As you know, when it comes to expectations, it's good to be expectant. It's good to hold the feet of polit your political leaders to the fire. Uh, that is the job that uh, they were elected to do. They have to do the job. If you don't uh, like the heat, get out of the kitchen, as the popular saying goes. So it's, o it's okay to be expectant. But I think that given the extent of the damage, given the depth of our crisis, given the scope of the crisis, that has confronted Nigeria in the last, I would say, two, three decades, decades if you want to go that far, mm. uh, I think it will be, 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 be unrealistic to expect Buhari to change things uh, or to turn things around in four years. He only has four years in the first instance. Mm. And so I think we have to moderate our expectations. That's where it can be a bad thing. For Buhari, on Buhari's part, he can't allow himself to be seduced or to be pressured by the weight of expectations. He has to do what he wants to do. He has to have an agenda and stick to it and be disciplined. He can't allow those expectations to dictate what he does. Otherwise, it will lead him to error. It will lead him to mistake. He can't hurry policy pronouncements. He can't hurry things just because Nigerians are expectant. He has to be methodical. He has to take his time. He has to study the extent of the damage before he knows where to go, before he can chat. Uh, you know, a future direction mm -hmm. before he, before he can chart a veritable direction for his uh, for his government. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where the expectation management aspect of it is criti critical. I think because not only as a president, not only are you trying to fulfill the expectation of those who voted you into power, but you are also trying to manage those expectations. And after he won the election, Buhari was very very. I think he did something that really impressed me, which was to tamp down the expectation. To, to bring people back from the high, you know, from the euphoria of the victory, and to tell them, look, this is going to take time. It's going to require a collective effort. I can't do it alone. But beyond that, you have to give me time to study things. Uh, this damage was not done in a day, and it certainly we can't fix things in a day. So he did that, and I think Nigerians are very understanding. I, I always like to tell people that, you know, we Nigerians, we are very fickle. We are very easy to please. You know, it takes very little to please us, especially in our relationship with our political leaders. Mm. But it takes very little to tick us off and to get us angry. Mm. You know, it takes just one event mm. for Nigerians to lose faith in their leaders, mm. for that core, that, that, that um, social contract mm. between Nigerians and their leaders to be severe. And once it's severe, it's very hard to restore it. Mm. So Buhari has to be mindful of that. Okay. The other I, think, I think Nigerians have uh, as much time as it needs to fix things. Okay. The other thing I wanted to ask you, what other things stood out from that speech for you? I think uh, on a symbolic rhetorical level, he said, I'm going to be president for everyone, for all Nigerians. Mm. And that includes the millions of Nigerians who did not vote for him. Let's not forget, this was a hard-fought election. Uh, it became anticlimactic to some extent because the former president considered, uh, I mean, you know, was very generous and very magnanimous uh, in accepting defeat. But prior to that time, we had, we had a divided nation, and nobody knew what was going to happen. Uh, there was a lot of bitterness. There was a lot of uh, mutual 
uh, you know, recriminations. There were a lot of, I mean, friendships were torn apart. Uh, relationships were broken because of this election. You have to, I mean, I saw some of it on social media, you know, uh, and there was a lot of bitterness and division in the country. Uh, and so for him to say that, I think it represents his commitment to healing, to, to healing those divisions, those cleavages that divide us, those, 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 those uh, fault lines, mm -hmm. as it were. Because mm -hmm. to, to rebuild the country, we are going to need unity. We are going to need to come together mm -hmm. and buy into the agenda that Buhari has for the country. And for him to say that, I think it's a very powerful symbolic statement mm -hmm. that he's not going to allow the bitterness and the divisions of the elections to persist and to soil and contaminate the atmosphere and make his job uh, harder. Mm. And so I think that's, that was very significant for me. Mm. Now, the speech, uh, Boko Haram had more than three, or about three paragraphs in the speech. Uh, one of the things he said was that the military will now move the uh, defense headquarters to Meduguri. Uh, do you think that is um, significant? It is. Uh, again, you know, one, one doesn't have to interpret these statements literally. I don't think he's going to move all the equipment and all the emphasis. We're not going to see uh, a, you know, a physical movement of the defense, defense headquarters or a build, building of a new defense headquarters in Medjugorje. These things are symbolic. These things are supposed to communicate to the military echelon, to the top echelon of the military that, look, I'm not going to run this war from a distance. I'm going to be a hands-on commander-in-chief. That is what it says to the military hierarchy. Unlike the past administration, where everything, until, up until the last moment, uh, you know, everything was coordinated from Abuja by the military bigwigs who were not on the ground, who didn't see what was happening in the battlefield, who didn't see the plight of the soldiers, who didn't see the, the, the challenges confronting them, who actually didn't see and therefore misun uh, underestimated the strength of Boko Haram on the ground. Unlike the previous uh, template, on the, uh, unlike the pre 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 previous paradigm, Buhari is saying by this pronouncement that I'm going to be, as a commander in chief, I'm going to be on the ground, I'm going to be where the action is, which is in the northeastern part of the country. We do agree, everybody agrees, uh, is the epicenter of the crisis of the Boko Haram uprising. It used to be the headquarters. The city used to be to house the headquarters of Boko Haram. So I'm going to confront them where they, use, where they are located. And we're going to move military pl planning, the logistical aspect of the military, the planning department, everything is going to be in Medugri. So it's a very powerful, symbolic statement that indicates, again, uh, the seriousness with which he regards the threat of Boko Haram. Mm. Now, one, one aspect of his speech that uh, a lot of people are still thinking about is the issue of whether to probe past administration or not. He talked about not uh, being not willing, being willing to um, settle old scores. But also he said, talking about the division of the government, the, the, in terms of the local government, the uh, state government, and the role of the federal government, he said that, I will not have kept my own trust with the Nigerian people if I allow others to abuse their own trust under my watch. How is he going to navigate this? I mean, in terms of um, playing the role uh, that the Constitution gave out or outlined without um, infringing on the rights of other um, government um, uh, levels, so, so to say? Uh, listen, I mean, it's a good, it's a delicate balance. You know, it's a delicate balance. It's not going to be easy. One thing I do know, because he's constrained by the Constitution, like you said, uh, he has to go by uh, the protocols of governance laid down by the Constitution. He cannot operate outside of those uh, protocols and those procedures. But at the same time, you know, I like to say to people, we are Africans. And as Nigerians, we are a subset of Africans. Uh, and in my studies, in my, and I teach about these things, I like to look at Africans culture, as cultural, being culturally different. We come from a different political tradition, and that tradition condition us, socialize us, to take our cues from the person at the top, from the leader, from the authority figure, whether that person is a president or king or chief or CEO or whatever. We are conditioned by our, conditioned by our culture to look at what is going on at the top, to take our signal from there. So I think it's going to be, why, while he cannot dictate to the states and to the local governments, I think his example, his personal example, uh, the body language, 
uh, that people see coming out of Asso Rock is going to be critical in instilling discipline, in instilling a different governing temperament to mm. people who to political operative at the state level, at the local government level. Uh, I think it's going to be critical. His personal example, you know, don't underestimate that. It, it could go very far because of our culture. We like to see what the, the man at the top or the old guy at the top is doing, mm -hmm. and then we take our cue from there, and that uh, trickles down and dictates what goes on at the lower levels. So I think, you know, let's not uh, underestimate that. Even within the ambit of democracy, mm -hmm. that can still be very important. Mm -hmm. now, one last question. We're really out of time. Uh, I know you wrote a book on the caliphate, the Sokoto Caliphate, a well-acclaimed book. I want to ask you, which, what happened today is actually a geopolitical shift in power from the south to the north. Uh, it's also um, something that uh, is very important in Nigeria. What do you think would be uh, the, the way the political base of uh, President Buhari is going to impact the administration? Uh, well, it, it, every, every president, every politician has his home base, as it were. For Buhari, it's the Northwest. But, you know, given, the, given what we know about this election, the fact that his mandate is uh, very national, which uh, is a Nigerian mandate because he enjoyed support from virtually all parts of the country. Uh, there was a broad-based coalition that brought him to power. I think it's going to be significant in multiple ways. He's going to obviously need the home base, this, his, his constituency, to support his agenda and then go out there from that home base, spread out, and try to win other geopolitical uh, entities uh, around, to bring them around his agenda, to, to, to enable them, to, to help them buy into his agenda. But I think more symbolically, what, what, that, what that means is that even the people in his home base, the Hausa Fulani or the Muslims, whatever you want to call them, now realize that Buhari does not belong to them, that they cannot monopolize Buhari, they cannot constrain Buhari. Mm. Buhari is a national political figure. There's a weight of expectations from all parts of the country are, uh, that, are, that are weighing down on him, and they cannot expect that he will do what pleases them, that he will kowtow to their interest all the time. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's going to give them a few things, but it's also going to have to uh, cater to the interest of the generality of Nigerians, the people that voted for him in mass in different parts of the country. Mm -hmm. So I think it says to them that, look, the era of caliphate domination, I really don't want to, I don't like to use this word, but the era of this caliphate domination, uh, as the Southern press like to put it, in Nigerian politics is over. Even though we have a, a, a northern house Afulani president, he really does not, uh, he is not going to be able to operate in that mode. He's not going to be an house Afulani president. Mm -hmm. He cannot be because of the circumstances of his ascendance to the presidency. All right. Um, thank you so much, Professor Moses Sachano. Thank you for joining us. No problem. All right. Um, that has been Professor Moses Sachon, a professor of African history at Vanderbilt University. When we come back, we are going to talk to the publisher of Sahara Reporters, uh, Omoyo Leshore, who is in Abuja currently. So stay tuned. <laughs>